Hi, I'm Craig T. Nelson, and welcome to Top Speed, the amazing history of mankind's passion for traveling ever faster. It was here on the Detroit River where the first Gold Cup boat race was run in 1916. And back then, competitors struggled to reach 50 miles an hour. Today, awesome machines like this offshore catamaran easily travel 140 miles per hour, and some jet boats travel twice that speed. These boat racers are a courageous group, because unlike the smooth and predictable surface of a racetrack, water is always changing, and even a tiny mistake can be disastrous. But that hasn't stopped some adventurous souls from daring death to test the limits of top speed on the water. Water, the fluid womb of primordial life covering nearly three-fourths of the Earth's surface. An irresistible invitation for speed. It's one of those ultimate challenges. For centuries, man has faced the enormous risks of going faster and faster on the water, despite the tantalizing reality that death lurks just beneath the surface. From early steam pistons to jet-powered rockets, the water speed record now stands at a blistering 317 miles per hour. The reality of water at 300 mile an hour is that if you crash, you're gonna hit with a pressure of three and a half thousand pound per square inch on your body. You become instant fish food. And while land speed records reach a higher speed, there's a reason water claims more lives. You can't predict what it's going to do exactly. You know, it's constantly altering. Even though the speeds are slower than on land, it's actually potentially much more dangerous. It's a small club of survivors, record holders who have astonished the world with their awesome achievements, setting records, making history, and facing death to extend man's reach into previously unattainable realms of top speed. Today, the pursuit of speed on the water takes many forms. The American Power Boat Association has 10 different categories of racing, with as many as 13 classes of boats in each category. From bone-crushing, ocean-going offshore power boats, the tunnel boats who race against each other on a twisty river course to those single-minded pursuers of the ultimate raw speed reaching out for the next level has long been part of man's drive to do more be more and go faster i would suspect that there is a love affair between man and water man and boats most race boats have a name um, and they have a personality. There's almost something uh, living about a boat. As early as 40,000 BC, mankind took to the ocean building wooden dugout boats to migrate along the Southeast Asian island chain to the continent of Australia. As they grew in size and were able to carry large amounts of cargo and crewmen, they became known as ships. Mechanical technology was first used successfully in 1807 in the Claremont Steamboat designed by Robert Fulton. From the first, speed was a major goal for these commercial vehicles. Faster boats meant more trips, which meant more income. Steam piston engines could propel ships to speeds of almost 24 miles an hour. Meanwhile, an Irish-born inventor, Charles Parsons, made a major leap forward by creating the steam turbine. Instead of the steam pushing pistons up and down, Parsons used steam to spin a turbine that in turn spun the propeller. He tried to convince the British Admiralty that a steam turbine was a superior method of achieving high speeds, but they only laughed at it. Undeterred, Parsons built the Red Turbinia, 
and took it to the 1897 Diamond Jubilee Review of Queen Victoria's fleet. In front of the entire British Navy and Queen Victoria, the uninvited Parsons surprised everyone. At one point, Turbinia was so close to uh, one of the steam picket boats that the officer unbuckled his sword, ready to jump in because he was so scared that she was going to run him down. In fact, the Turbinia could run circles around anything on the water. At 100 feet long, the steel-plated boat reached speeds of 34 knots or 39 miles an hour, nearly 50% faster than the next closest ship. Most of the big ships switched to Parsons steam turbine, while smaller boats turned to another new technology, the gasoline-powered engine. The 1900 Universal Exposition in Paris featured the first motorboat race in history along the River Seine. And the winning boat averaged just under 10 miles per hour. Before the start of official racing, the desire to go fast in a boat had a very practical and natural origin. The folks at the big sailing yachts, the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, at the end of the day, they wanted to get back to the club to get a drink with their buddies. So they all had these little power launches made that could go faster than the sailboats. So they tear back to the yacht club, and the last one back had to buy drinks for everybody else. And before too long, that sort of developed into a race, and then there were rules, and, and then real racing was born. But it all started from trying to get back to the yacht club so you didn't have to buy the drinks. In 1901, an unofficial world record for speedboats of 22.35 miles per hour was set by a boat powered by a Mercedes Daimler automobile motor. In one year, the world water speed record doubled to 45 miles per hour, set by the 130-foot steel and aluminum Arrow. The first to create a trophy for boat versus boat racing was the English Lord Alfred Harmsworth, publisher of the Daily Mail. In 1903, the first Harmsworth Cup was surprisingly won by a woman, Dorothy Levitt, who piloted the Napier One to victory. Then in 1904, the American Powerboat Association, the APBA, created the Gold Challenge Cup. Like the Harmsworth Cup, the Gold Cup races featured boats going head-to-head -head on a river course. One of the first major breakthroughs in boat design was the hydroplane. By adding a step to the bottom of the boat, as the engine pushed the boat forward, the step helped lift part of the boat off the water, reducing friction and increasing speed. Among the first step hydroplanes was the Maple Leaf Fort, driven by Thomas Sopwith, designer of the famous Camel biplane. It made its first winning appearance in 1912. Soon, the arena of super-fast boats had its first superstar, Gar Wood. He became the dominant force on the water in the first half of the 20th century. Garwood was an inventor and an American industrialist in the early teens. He patented the hydraulic lift, he invented the dump truck, and he made millions of dollars. And he took that money and he got involved in boat racing. And in, in many ways he typifies that kind of American ingenuity of the 20s, that bigger is better, and everything he did was bigger and faster and heavier than anything that had been done prior to that. He first made his mark on the water in 1917 when he won the APBA Gold Cup in Miss Detroit 2 with a speed of 56 miles per hour. Always the innovator. The following year, Wood put an airplane engine in his boat. People scoffed and doubted its reliability. But with the huge, powerful new engine, Wood easily won his second Gold Cup with the Miss Detroit 3. Wood so dominated the Gold Cup races, winning an unmatched eight cups, that the APBA changed the rules, adding limitations to what Wood was allowed to do with his boats and their engines. So, Wood switched his efforts to winning the unrestricted, unlimited Harmsworth Trophy. And he decided that he would build a boat to win the trophy back for the United States. And what better and what more noble of thing than to call his boat Miss America. In 1920, Gar Wood's boat, Miss America, beat the Maple Leaf, and the Harmsworth Trophy returned to America. 
With a flair for the dramatic, in 1921, Wood challenged the ultra-fast locomotive Havana Special to a race from Miami to New York. Wood beat the train by 12 minutes, captivating his growing legion of fans nationwide. Gar Wood achieved on the water what Babe Ruth did in a ballpark, and he received a similar level of public acclaim. There would be hundreds of thousands of people show up with the Detroit River to watch one of the Harmsworth Challenges. Just the spectator craft alone were a phenomenal fleet of runabouts, of yachts, of motor yachts. Wood not only raced head-to-head, -head, but also vied for the absolute water speed record. At this point, the rules for establishing an official record were first created. A boat must make two runs one in each direction with the speed from each run averaged together to achieve the official top speed. In this way, wind and current effects were eliminated. In 1928, Wood pushed the record up to 92.8 miles per hour with Miss America 7. Now, true to their nature, water speed racers reached for 100 miles per hour at all costs. Return to top speed on the History Channel. Gar Wood had established himself as the man to beat. In this high-speed arena of numerous near-death experiences, good luck charms were common. Wood always raced with two teddy bears strapped to the wheel of his boat. One of Wood's challengers shared his superstitions. Marion Joe Carstairs, good luck mascot, was a doll named Lord Todd Wadley. Carstairs, born of an American mother and an English father, was an heiress to a portion of the Standard Oil fortune. She liked to be known as Joe Carstairs. She was an extremely colorful millionaireess. Her Estelle boats were named after her mother, but unfortunately none of her boats were quick enough quite to be contenders for either the Harmsworth or for the water speed record. With Joe Carstairs unable to beat Garwood, the English turned to land speed champion Henry Seagrave. Seagrave and his team became obsessed with the rivalry. They aimed to dethrone Garwood at any cost. They built a faster, more powerful boat, Miss England II. She had the best of England's everything, best of England's engines, the best pilot. Don't forget, Seagrave was a knight, Sir Henry Seagrave. He held the land speed record. And he went out onto that lake, and it became embarrassing because the propellers kept busting. Finally, the boat seemed ready. It was Friday the 13th, and some people warned Seagrave to wait. But Seagrave was determined to beat Wood's record. Defying the superstitions that ruled so many speed challengers, Seagrave made his two runs and amazingly beat Wood's record, setting a new world water speed mark of 98.8 miles an hour. But then he decided to push his luck. Seagrave said, I'm going to see what this boat can do, and we'll beat the pants off Garwood. And so he turned her around, and he put her to full throttle, and she was going at about 120 miles an hour when she hit a submerged log and the water pressure flipped the boat over. Seagrave died three hours later without the official two-way run above 100 miles per hour. His boat fared better. Miss England was salvaged and repaired. Less than a year later, Wood added superchargers to his twin Packard engines in the Miss America 9. And on March 20th, 1931, Gar Wood became the first man to officially top 100 miles an hour on the water. British boat barons tapped race car driver Kay Don who got behind the wheel of the salvaged Miss England II, now with a steel-plated bottom. 
dawn, astonishingly, top wood speed achieving 103.5 miles per hour just one short month after Wood's record run. A frantic, bare-knuckled seesaw battle began with Don and Wood trading the record back and forth time and again. In 1932, with a massively powerful Miss America 10, Gar Wood reached a record that held for five years. Unbeaten in the Harmsworth, the first man above 100 miles an hour, Wood retired from racing in 1933. There were some practical applications of Wood's efforts as the United States entered World War II. One of his designs became the basis for the Navy's PT boats. Their reliability and high speed were crucial to the success of the island hopping campaign in the Pacific theater of World War II. But the British were not through. Soon, another challenger arrived from England. Malcolm Campbell was intensely patriotic, fiercely competitive, and firm in his belief in the superiority of all things British. Campbell grabbed the land speed record by breaking 300 miles an hour, and then set his sights on Gar Wood's mark. But he decided to forego the head-to-head -head Harmsworth race and focus on pure speed. Garwood was furious. He said, this guy Campbell, he's designing a paper boat. That boat couldn't take one turn of the Harmsworth course. Malcolm Campbell's Bluebird K3, by less than two miles an hour, captured the world water speed record for England and himself with a speed of 126.3 miles per hour in 1937. Never satisfied, Campbell adopted a new, more advanced hydroplane called the Ventnor three-point hydroplane and built the Bluebird K4. Instead of all of the boat in the water, this had two points at the front, one at the back, which literally lifted the boat out of the water. So there was far less drag, the boat went a lot quicker. In 1939, Campbell reached 141 miles an hour in the Bluebird K4. But with the start of the Second World War, the pursuit of records was set aside. After the war, Campbell looked to the air for a source of speed for his boat. During the war, the jet engine was developed first by Germany. The awesome power delivered by the spinning turbine produced enormous thrust. In 1947, Campbell took his pre-war boat, the Bluebird K4, and modified it, adding the jet engine and an aerodynamic shell. The new K4 had no propeller. It was pushed through the water by the enormous thrust of the jet engine. But it wasn't as easy as it sounded. It's all a question of trial and error. We're, we're, this is all an experiment. But um, we shall stick at it until we have uh, uh, overcome all these difficulties, whatever happens. Throughout 47 and 48, Campbell failed to get his new jet-powered boat to go faster than his old record mark. Aging and in poor health, he retired. It wouldn't be long before another challenger with a new approach to achieving death-defying top speeds would topple Campbell's record. Turn to top speed on the History Channel. After the retirement of Malcolm Campbell, the next record setter came from America. Ted Jones designed and built the slow motion driven by Stan Sayers. It was not a jet boat, but a prop rider, where the rear of the boat lifts completely out of the water and rides on the spinning propeller, reducing friction enormously. The slow motion was extremely successful. The first thing it tried to do was break the straightaway speed record that Malcolm Campbell had. And they were able to break the record by 20 miles an hour. 
The slow motion four captured the world speed record at 160 miles per hour on June 26, 1950. Again, the spirited competition between England and America heated up as the current land speed record holder, John Cobb, took to the water. The latest challenger to the world's water speed record held at the moment by America is the new British jet engine ski boat Crusader. Britain's latest jet boat will be getting its first try out at Loch Ness. He had one very successful run at Loch Ness where he went through the traps at over 280 miles an hour. On his return run, the forward planing surface of the boat collapsed and the boat disintegrated and Cobb was killed immediately. After Cobb's destruction, another Englishman came forward to challenge the mercurial, murderous waters. Donald Campbell came by his quest naturally. He was practically born into the high-speed game as the son of Malcolm Campbell. He literally was bitten by a speed bug, if there is such a thing. He was just there for the, the thrill of the speed. And I think when my grandfather died, um, the Americans were, again, looking at wanting to break the water speed record, which was his father's. And he just dug his heels in and thought, well, it's my father's record, and I'm here to, to carry on. For whatever reason people tempt death, Campbell decided to go after the water speed record with a jet-powered boat. Cobb, despite his gruesome death, proved that jet engines were the key to a major leap in speed. And he worked with two young designers, Ken and Lewis Norris, and they put together a plan for the Bluebird K7. It was to be built around the jet, it was to be virtually an airplane. Now when Bluebird K7 first got on top, when I saw this boat get onto the top of the water, I just had to turn away. I couldn't actually look at it at all. And it was such an emotion. It's on and it's going fast and, I, and I'm party to this. My brother and I have done this. The Norris brothers and Donald Campbell created the Bluebird K7. The 26-foot all-metal craft had a distinctively unique shape and featured the three-point hydroplane system. It was powered by a turbojet engine that delivered 4,000 pounds of thrust. Like Gar Wood and Joe Carstairs, Donald Campbell always carried with him a good luck mascot. His was a single teddy bear named Mr. Wappet. In July of 1955, Donald Campbell and Mr. Wappet brought his Bluebird K7 to 202 miles per hour. He reclaimed for his family and his country the title of fastest man on water. Bit by bit, over the next nine years, Campbell pushed his speed up to 260 miles per hour. Another challenger came forward, again from America. After making his mark in drag boat racing, Lee Taylor had a boat built around a jet engine. It was called the Hustler. Taylor was ready to run in 1964. He was running on Lake Havasu in April when the throttle failed to close down after a run. Taylor was faced with two options. Did he stay with the boat, which was quite clearly going to run out of water, or did he bail out? Well, I've sat in that boat, and I don't understand how the guy managed to bail out, but bail out he did. Taylor was injured jumping out of the boat, but worse was to follow because when the Coast Guard put him on the stretcher, somehow the stretcher began to slide on the rock, the result of which was that the helicopter was destabilized and also crashed. So for the second time in as many minutes, Lee Taylor had a serious accident and was being rescued. Ironically, Hustler was virtually undamaged. If Taylor had stayed with the boat, he would certainly have fared better. Instead, Lee Taylor had to spend the next 18 months learning again how to walk and talk. But he would return to the great water speed chase. With the end of 1964 approaching, Donald Campbell pushed the Bluebird K7 to another new world record of 276 miles per hour. Donald Campbell was exactly the same character as his father. 
and no sooner had he succeeded at something than he became dissatisfied with that success. His next goal was to top 300 miles per hour, but there was more at stake than mere records. Financial solvency was at risk, as well as life and limb. The world of record breaking went to a dip at that time. You couldn't get sponsorships at, at all, it seemed. In order to regain the media spotlight and the financial support of backers, Campbell felt that he must break the 300 mile an hour limit. He took a team and the Bluebird K7 up to Lake Coniston in the middle of November. Bad weather and mechanical difficulties with a new jet engine prevented anything worthwhile from happening. Time was running out. Finally, after New Year's, the water and the weather conditions seemed right. However, for the obsessively superstitious Campbell, there was a troubling omen. The night before the run, he was playing solitaire, and he turned up in succession the Ace of Spades and the Queen of Spades. And he commented to people there in the room that this is the very hand that Mary, Queen of Scots, turned up the night before she was executed, and that someone in his family was going to die tomorrow. Uh, I think he used the word, someone's going to get the chop tomorrow. I hope it's not me. Campbell was finally ready on January the 4th, and on his first run, he achieved 297 miles an hour, three miles an hour below his target speed. So he turned around and with an empty boat, ran down that lake, reached a speed of 320 miles an hour. The boat lifted, looped the loop, and with Campbell commenting, I've got the bows up, I've gone. Oh, it crashed into the water. Hello, the bow back. Again. Campbell's body was never found, probably because it disintegrated with the boat. They found his socks, his shoes, they even found his teddy bear. The feeling is that Campbell took a calculated risk that went wrong. It was something that he simply went out, I think, in a bloody-minded mood, saying, today's the day we do it, let's get it done. It was a calculated risk that sadly didn't come off. Even with Donald Campbell's death a daily reminder and his own earlier accident, Lee Taylor continued to push towards 300 miles per hour. The Hustler was repaired and ready to go. In June of 1967, Taylor finally topped Campbell with a speed of 285 miles per hour, still shy of 300. But now the fastest man on water was an American. But stories swirled around Taylor's new record. It was widely reported that because of his earlier near fatal crash, Taylor was shy about using the boat's full power and that his crew tricked him into reaching record-breaking speeds by changing the throttle settings in the boat and the floats marking the distance on the course. The people I've talked to, his manager at the time, all of them deny knowing anything about it. So even if it's true, I think it's understandable with what the guy had been through. But knowing his character, I don't give too much credence to that story. It was another 10 years before someone came along to take Taylor's title. Someone with a lifelong love of water. Someone far away in Australia. He is the Horatio Alger of the water speed record. A self-made man who accomplished the impossible on water and lived to tell about it. I'm Craig T. Nelson, and welcome back to Top Speed Water, here on the History Channel. The water exerts a powerful and consistent pull over mankind. In Australia, one native son pursued his childhood dream obsessively. 
Ken Warby was gripped by the challenge of the water speed record and filled with admiration for those who came before him. The early uh, guys in Unlimited were definitely my heroes. I could see these guys going out and going where no man had ever gone before, and that was a challenge. And, you know, in life, there are not many challenges left. There are not too many unknowns that you can step into. But it was always the mechanical challenge. It's the achievement of designing the best mousetrap. From the beginning, Warby was an eager boat builder. He's characteristically frank about his first boat, built at the age of 16. It was a terrible boat. It was an absolutely terrible boat. The design was terrible, the method of building it was bad, and I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. But Warby was persistent and learned from his mistakes. Then, in the late 60s, a friend told him about an auction the Australian Air Force was holding to get rid of outdated jet engines. Warby bought two for $100 each, and then a third for $65. He now had the key ingredient to make an attempt to reach his dream. And once I got those, one Saturday night, I sat down on the kitchen table and designed Spirit of Australia. And the whole drawing was just a pencil sketch on a 30 by 20 piece of paper, a land elevation, the rest was just in the brain. No shop at all. Uh, just pure backyard, jet engines laying in the dirt, kids playing on them, neighbours looking over the fence, absolutely amazed at what I was doing, thinking I was quite nuts. Well, I had uh, some of three electric power tools, and, you know, it was called the impossible dream, and I had all the sceptics in the world out there that were giving me a hard time. Ah, oh, you can't do it, this will never work. While his doubters were legion, Warby persisted. Little by little, he built up his speed and made adjustments to the boat, continually refining the design. Amazingly, Warby built his boat not from some exotic space-age material, but from something once alive, wood. And when it came time to go for the official record, Warby always had help. Volunteers who donated their time to make the impossible happen. Finally, on November 20th, 1977, at Blowering Dam, Warby was ready to go for the record. After sleeping in his car to save hotel money in order to buy plywood, enduring mechanical setbacks and the jeers of universal doubters, Ken Warby drove his spirit of Australia and broke Taylor's record by just over three miles an hour. But Warby's biggest fan didn't watch. I think the nicest benefit was my mum saw it before she died. But she'd come to the lake and, you know, she'd stand by the lake and she has never seen the boat run and she'd turn and watch the trees. But she was proud. Yeah. Yeah, sit on your knee. Yeah. There you are. Sit on your you want to knee. sit on me knee? I sat on yours often enough. <laughs> <laughs> Convinced that he can break through the elusive 300 mile per hour barrier, Warby planned to return a year later. It's supposedly the most dangerous sport on earth with the death rate that it's got. But you know, this has been a life passion. It's, it's not just somebody that said, hey, I got a jet engine, I'm gonna break the world speed record. The second time around, now as the world water speed record holder, Warby had the assistance of the Australian Air Force, who helped him tune his boat's jet engine to its peak level. Less than a year after setting the record, Warby broke through the elusive barrier, a barrier that had already claimed more than one life. On October 8th, 1978, Warby became the first man to top 300 miles an hour on the water and live. You know, people uh, say, well, you know, what's it feel like at 300 mile an hour? Well, you explain sex to me and then I'll be able to tell you what 300 mile an hour is. People who understand the true level of achievement are in short supply. Warby was the first and only person in history to design, build, and drive a boat to a world speed record, the undisputed fastest man on water. Why do people climb the mountains? 
you know, the mountains are there to be climbed and records are made to be broken. And it's a matter of uh, personal achievement. Raise the speed record. I'd like to call out. Former record holder Lee Taylor mounted a new challenge to Warby standing. His boat was a Discovery II, a reverse three pointer similar in design to John Cobb's disastrous Crusader. Powered by a hydrogen peroxide rocket motor, Taylor was testing a $2.5 million boat at speeds above 260 miles per hour on November 13, 1980, when it corkscrewed, crashed, and disintegrated. Taylor's body, like so many others who tempted the gods of speed, was never found. You've got a surface that's moving. You can't go along and kick the hills off and fill the hollows up. That's impossible to do. So the risk is there, and it is a dangerous risk. And it's something you have got to come to peace with yourself, that you're willing to take that risk to get from one end of the lake to the other and, and believe you can do it. The pursuit of speed takes many forms and takes place in many arenas. Some even challenge the gods of speed on the open ocean. Turn to top speed on the History Channel. Speed is no longer a significant focus for transatlantic ocean crossings now that airplanes can make the trip in under three hours. But there are still those willing to apply technology and risk their lives to break the ocean crossing record and make the journey. The Destriero which set and continues to hold the blue ribbon for the unassisted Atlantic speed crossing, featured the absolute latest in nautical engine design. Power came from three general electric jet fighter engines configured for marine service. In order to obtain maximum speed and fuel efficiency, Information about the engines and the marine conditions were monitored and controlled by two onboard computers. The 220-foot-long boat averaged a blistering 53 knots during its record-breaking crossing from Europe to America. Open Ocean also serves as a race course for the APBA offshore powerboat racing. The Sitgo SuperGuard is the Class B national and world champion. Throttleman and owner Nigel Hook routinely pushes his boat to speeds atop 110 miles an hour in head-to-head -head racing on the swirling sea. It's just all absorbing. It, uh, it just, just draws you in. But with the boat going so fast and the water changing over time, it, it's just, uh, just a constant high. Another seeker of speed thrills and a claimant to the legacy of Gar Wood is Gold Cup champion Dave Bilwa. His Miss Budweiser, a super fast turbine powered unlimited hydroplane, races on an oval course at blistering speeds over 200 miles per hour. It's a challenging medium, you know, much like a mountain is to climb, really to, to operate one of these boats at 200 miles an hour over this type of terrain. It's a real challenge for both the crews and the driver. It brings out the best in all of us, I think. The competitors, to me, are really what makes the race worthwhile. You know, not racing just against the clock, but racing against the competitor. Drag boat racing is another high-powered challenge. 
These flat out speed demons reach a top speed of 240 miles an hour in less than five seconds. Wherever there is a speed record, there's someone trying to break it. And sometimes drivers do cross over from the world of racing to the quest for pure speed. The outboard world water speed record was attacked by Bob Wartinger. As I progressed in boat racing, uh, one of those days I said, I wonder if I could set a speed record. And so we started to try and uh, attempt speed records and started setting them. Wartinger, a Boeing engineer, has more records than any other APBA driver in history, 100. He races boats for a simple reason. Because it's absolutely pure, unadulterated fun for me. It either grabs you and becomes something you want to work at, or you'd rather eat hot dogs. In November 1989, Wartinger took the boat and custom motor after two years of hard work and broke the world outboard record. One new technology making its way into the world of speed records is the electric powered boat. Uh, electric boats don't pollute the lake and they don't leak oil into the lake or gasoline, so it's maybe a way to go. Powered by uh, 12 batteries, it delivers about 125 horsepower and goes 70 miles an hour. It's built out of Boeing surplus honeycomb carbon fiber materials at 50 cents a pound. So we paid about $100 for the uh, carbon fiber material and about $100 worth of fiberglass. Uh, it's really pretty cheap boat. Cost aside, Dave Cloud's electric powered hydroplane holds a world record of 70.5 miles an hour. We're doing speeds that are respectable. We're throwing a lot of water up in the corners because of our weight, which is really a pretty sight, too. No matter what the source of power is, someone always comes along to try and capture the record. A project named Quicksilver is on target to make a fresh attempt on the 317 mile per hour record set by Warby way back in 1978. The driver is Nigel McKnight. Oh, I see. Yeah. So in other words, there's two mountains, mountains here oh, yeah. in series. The head designer knows a thing or two about record breaking. Ken Norris was one of the key designers of the Bluebird K7, the first boat over 200 miles per hour. He came and said, look, I want to break a water speed. He said, I want to break a record, you know, and I'll raise the money I'll get somehow. And so what can you do for me? Will you design it? The Quicksilver Project purchased a British Buccaneer, a nuclear attack jet fighter for its two jet engines. And that gives us one to use in the boat and one that we can retain as a spare. And we keep both of those engines in full perfect working order by running the Buccaneer every, every 14 days. They have just over uh, 11,000 pounds, these engines. So we've got uh, nearly two and a half times the power that Donald Campbell had. The design has not been tried. It's a reverse four-pointer. But with years of experience as a cutting-edge designer behind him and a judicious test program, McKnight feels the confidence of a long history. I think history comes into it a lot. I feel that the project is a natural successor to the Bluebird legend and the Campbell dynasty. And especially with the link that we have with Ken Norris having worked so closely with Donald Campbell in the, in the 50s and the 60s. While McKnight may be setting up another version of the great speed duels of the past, he will still have the current claimant on the title fastest man on water to deal with. Ken Warby's new boat is nearly ready. But Warby is interested in leaving room for others to top his anticipated new speed record. The numbers don't matter. Don't want to set it too high. My kid might want to ride the next one. Wherever man goes, he seeks a challenge. Where none exist, he invents one. 
Where variables change, are unpredictable, are often deadly, the challenge is all the greater and the triumph all the more magnificent. Nowhere is the challenge greater than on water. The fastest man on water thinks there are many barriers ahead to be broken. One day the sound barrier will be broken on water. I probably won't be around to see it, although I really would like to see it. Whoever does it is going to be up against enormous odds. It's going to be far worse than anything I've ever been up against. Uh, because remember, at a certain speed, water can cut steel. As long as man breathes, new challengers will emerge, willing to risk joining their speed-seeking soulmates in a watery grave in the attempt to wear the Speed King crown. Well, somehow it doesn't really matter whether you're chasing that demon in a high-powered boat, or race car, or jet airplane. No matter how fast we go, there's always another record out there waiting to be broken haunting us with its promise of immortality, of joy, of sheer exhilaration as we continue to reach for top speed. For the History Channel, I'm Craig T. Nelson, and thanks for watching.